supporting all 32 counties through the Alliance Leagues. Remember that, then. And a small bit of a needle there. Yeah. Come on, Mayo, you've got to get Andy Moran into the game. Listen, big and now they're really rolling. And I can tell you, tell you, there won't be a cold milk I'll declare for at least a week. The league is done, the championship looms. Is defensive football dead? Hello, everyone. You're very welcome to the Alliance. Irish Examiner Gaelic Football Show. My name is Paul Rouse and I'm joined by the former Armagh footballer Roisin McConville, by the former Mayo footballer Keith Higgins and by the former Cork footballer Paddy Kelly. Roisin, did you enjoy your trip to Killarney? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> what is, first of all, when you walk in the stadium and when you go to the press box, like your eyes are not drawn to what's going on in the pitch. Your eyes are drawn to the scenery behind it and it's just an unbelievable setting for a match first and foremost um, and then the match started and Throne settled in lovely first 10 minutes looked okay it looks like it was going to be really competitive because I was unsure going down the road if, if Throne would put much stock on it um, but they were they were trying they were trying a few different things out and then just Kerry just just exploded and honestly it was, it was, it was sensational to watch. It was the quickness of the hands and the movement, um, the instincts just of the forwards. Everything was just, you know, whenever he got the ball, you were thinking a goal was on every time. And rather than thinking about would this work against Dublin, the tendency is. You know, when you've seen a, a lot of football over the last number of weeks, it's just to sit back and, and well, I was, I was still commentating, but I was sitting back just enjoying it and uh, taking it in for what it was. It was sensational. I don't have the vocabulary to describe how good it was at times. Um, Kerry are so good going forward. But you know what? I think the biggest thing they'll take out of it is actually how good they looked defensively as well um, for the majority of the game. Uh, Foley was absolutely brilliant. He was out in his own. Um, and in the midfield, they looked as if they had a lot more energy, uh, pace, uh, power, um, feeling ability. So uh, I suppose some of the questions that come out of the game for me was, you know, is David Morn is he an option for... Uh, carry in the middle of the field now but definitely um, if he is then O'Connor has to play alongside him because uh, he, he gives them that uh, I say that energy and that athleticism uh, to get up and down the pitch but performance wise Paul and am this was something from another planet for 20 minutes it was scary how good they were Clifford Clifford will get all of the all of the headlines but like Sean O'Shea and, and just the intelligence and and like for Clifford being the player he is and the amount of times he brings other people into it. I mean, there's a case study alone. There's a thesis, Paul, if you're interested, on his bounce uh, and how it entices defenders in to try and uh, get a hand on the ball. And if they don't, you know, he's able to get away and he's able to um, to create something. But as I say, it was. It was just sit back and just enjoy it for, for 25 minutes or whatever it was. Sensational. We'll come back and talk about Tyrone a little bit later, but Paddy, Oshin seems to be suggesting that Cork fielding a team in the Munster Championship this year is a kind of a futile exercise. Yeah, I thought we probably feared that last year as well, but things uh, went a bit differently. Um, yeah, look, I think Kerry North Mastery from last year, I think their their approach to Cork game was crazy. Um their their defensive style play, playing being you know, able in the in the forwards and just the the general style of their game was 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 madness last year because you know Kerry are playing at a different level to Cork so if you're at that higher level you go and you squeeze up and you put pressure on everything and you you know you force turnovers and play the game at huge speed um, I think Kerry learned last year that they can't go back to that defensive style it just doesn't suit their their tradition look they look class like Tyrone thought caught desperately on a few of the goals like that similar to how Con Con Hallen 
Carl Kerry a few weeks ago in the league, your man came out for the ball and, and looping back over and a hand pass over. It was twice that that, that same move came to catch Tyrone. Um, look, Kerry looked very, very good. If you're trying to ask me where Cork are in comparison, it's very difficult to judge. Um, like Division 2 is, is miles off in terms of the, the tempo and the speed and physicality. Cork Westmead was brilliant on Saturday, uh, one of the best games of football I've seen in a long, long time. Um, Westmead, to be fair, I haven't seen much of them, but they were, they were very impressive, very good style, very good forwards. Um, and Cork were a little lucky enough to come out with the win, like, because Westmead had a couple of goal chances late in the first half and a, and a huge one towards the end of the second half, which brought it back to a couple of points, whereas Cork stuck there. Is, um, so it's uh, it's hard to know. Like I'd be very fearful going to Clarny. Like, yeah, anyone who goes to Clarny is, is going under savage pressure, but for this Cork team to go down, and, uh, sorry, I'm jumping the gun here now. I know I'm going ahead from, from once the quarterfinals and semifinals, but... Presuming both Cork and Kerry get there, um, it'll be a huge ask for this Cork team to go down. And um, did you and, ever win a match in Killarney? Did I what? Did you ever win a match in Killarney? Uh, no, not senior senior championship. No, unfortunately, not. No, it's uh, nineteen. Is it going back to nineteen ninety? It's twenty twenty plus years since the yeah there, I think. yeah. So like it's it's just it's a savage. As O'Shane said, look as a venue as a place to go to play a game. It's savage. Like they're just as a supporter as a player, it's brilliant. The pitch is just so open. It just lends itself to nice open football. Um, there's just something about it from Kerry. And look, they're, they don't want to be the team to lose that record. Um, but they look they look streets ahead. Look, I mean, we're talking about who's going to catch Dublin. Kerry are, are to me, the only one who are within, within arms reach them. Um, so if, if that's the case, then, you know, they should be looking looking to swat aside everyone in Munster. Keith, you saw Mayo against Clare. Can Clare lay at love on Kerry in two weeks' time in the Munster Championship from what you've seen? I don't think so. It's not from anything Clare have done or haven't done. I think it's just from the way Kerry have been playing. Um, you know, I think we spoke on this podcast the last time I was on about um, Kerry's going back to the way they play and how they play best and just getting their forwards in the right position. I know O'Shea was saying at the time he didn't believe in the whole Kerry DNA thing, but like... Like I said, you just play to your strengths and as there there with the forwards they have, you keep them close to goal, they'll do damage to any team. So, um, yeah, in fairness, as good and all as Clare have been um, and as competitive they, as they have been, you just can't see them getting close to Kerry, in fairness. If they put on that kind of performance again up in the forward line, you know, they're not going to be able to live with them. Did you think at any stage that Clare were going to be caught, or Clare were going to beat Mayo? This weekend, did you fear? Did you fear the game at any stage? Not really. No, I suppose. Look, from watching the game, I've been down there looking at it. It kind of started off very open. Um, do you know, I think Cor or Clare win was a five-three up. They win maybe after about ten minutes, something like that. You know, it was a very open start. But I thought once Mayo got into their rhythm, like Aiden started kind of winning a few balls around midfield from the Clare kickouts, and they started to win the breaks and. Once the boys just started driving up from the back then they just looked in complete control like you couldn't see anton but a handy may win but i think it was more a mixture of clear up in their game a bit in the second half and may be just easing off the throttle a bit which is a bit worrying um that's why the second half was so competitive but no like it, it never looked in any doubt i think once they got back to it, maybe about four points or three points at one stage it was kind of you're wondering how it was so close but no at no stage did it look like they were going to kick on and kind of get a win out of it Looking at the first half of that match on television, it looked to me that Mayo had were back with intensity, had a great run and game going. And how how would you explain the step off for a team that's trying to catch Dublin? You could never imagine Dublin letting Clare back into the game in the way Mayo did. No, absolutely not. And I suppose look, that's kind of the thing. Sometimes we've talked about in Mayo or been critical about is that. If you're playing a team that's a bit lower than where you seem to go down to their level rather than kind of playing at a higher level all the time which is again something you'd never say about Dublin they just consistently at that same level so look how you'd explain it I don't know to be quite honest with you like it was there was nothing that watching the game that really jumped out to say why that had happened it was just a case that they just seemed to kind of nearly once they went 10 or 11 points clear they just thought right this is all over and done with um and they just never seem to have really composure at stage in the second half you know and like i said they just let clear back into it and like the two goals i thought were very very soft in fairness you know um like the one from the foot was the 45 like Edo and matthew were back there and the two of them standing beside uh, the clearman feeder and let him jump with robbie which you know they shouldn't be happening in the small square so there were two very soft goals that kind of gave clear a bit of momentum 
Um, so yeah, I think it was just merely the kind of switched off at a couple of key stages. Paddy, are Clare the second best team in Munster? Yeah, well, I'd say it's a toss of coin between Cork and Clare, to be honest with you. Um, I know Cork went up to Ennis and beat them there last week or two weeks ago. But to be fair, like watching that game, you know, Clare knew they had the three point barrier. And you could see in the last five, ten minutes, it was Clare were, were, were holding out, make sure they didn't concede a goal. Um, I'd say Cork and Clare are very, very even. Um, and again, it's very unfortunate for Clare again that they're on the same side as Kerry. They have no chance to develop. Like their year realistically is done now. You know, they've, they've had a deep, very decent season so far. Um, you know, losing to Mayo by only a couple of points is, is a very good showing. They, you know, they, they won't be Kerry. You know, that's that's highly, highly unlikely. Um, they're they're developing nicely. It's just you know, are they going to plateau at that kind of mid-table division two, or will they will they get the chance to, to push on to division one? It's very very difficult to maintain division two. You know, every year just to, to not not lose those three or four games and get dragged down to relegation battle. They're doing so well there. It's just a pity that they haven't you know got got up to division one because it'd be great to see them up there. Um, I would still say Cork. I fancy Cork to beat them in a championship match. Um, but that's without any evidence to say so. Like Cork looked very very good the last day going forward. The Westmead game was a real throwback to, to you know, you attack, I attack. There was no massive sweep, there was no defensive systems. I would be very concerned about Cork's defensive um, play out these. It wasn't as if they were being caught without numbers back. They had numbers back. They always had an extra man back, but the physical size of the Cork backs is, is a bit of a concern. They were ran at by the Westmead lads and were brushed aside often and, and often fouled as well. So that would be a huge concern when you face the likes of Clifford, Ganey and, and Sean O'Shea and these lads. Like, so, um, you know, Cork, it's, you know, it's too late to, to do anything different. Though. I hope Cork just go for it, you know, hopefully take care of Limerick or Waterford and then have a right crack off Kerry below because, you know, we've maintained our Division 2 status and again, hopefully next year, you know, a seven season uh, division or a 17 division, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll push on it and push for Division 1 because we need to get back up there to be uh, comparing to the best. The, the football, Eamon Fitzmaurice described the style of football that's been played across leagues as samba football. Totally open, loads of attacking, loads of goal chances, except for the dubs. The dubs are played, again, pretty tight, kept a sort of solid structure, and again against Donegal. Oshin, can you see, it looks like the dubs were playing championship football the whole time and everyone else is playing open football. Is that fair or is that too simplistic? <laughs> Uh, I just think they stick to to what they know. I think um, they have a very uh, a fairly defined way of playing. I think um, they're also they're also looking for one or two players. There's, I'm still not sure about uh, Fenton's partner in the middle of the field, obviously. And then there's still a bit of rejigging to be done in the forward line uh, when Dean Rock comes back in, which inevitably he will. Uh, I believe he's back on the pitch this week, so that would suggest that he he probably start maybe their second championship match in, in Leinster. Um, but uh, as far as Dublin the way they play, played, it, it, they don't like a lot of fuss, um, and yet they still have a few players who can turn it on when they want. But uh, the weekend's game was meaningless to them. Do you know what I mean? I don't think it 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 really it really meant meant anything. I think the fact that uh, Donegal played a weakened team didn't help, um, and it was something that like if you can imagine the majority of the dubs there with uh, two pockets full of all Ireland medals, it's very difficult to get massively up for uh, a league semi final. No one there's probably not going to be a league final. Uh, against a weakened Donegal team in Breffney Park. You know, it's not one that's going to get the pulses racing for those boys, I don't think. So I think they're waiting for, you know, they, they probably won't cut loose until, you know, uh, semi final stages. And look, there's, they are still the, the team to beat. I mean, like, just talking about, if I can go back and carry for a second, um, like me and Thomas Niblock was along with me, and we were like, uh, we were like two giddy kids after after the game, and funny was this a bit of a, this was a BBC trip, was it? Was this yeah. is it different standards, different qualities around this? So like what? <laughs> Did you wear no, bowler hat? All, what happened? It was, it was all uh, it was all legal and both board. We're all vaccinated and all that. There we we didn't have to quarantine. We were down there, but uh, we were like two giddy kids after the game. I noticed Tony Lean had done the three laps of pitch. He was standing behind the goals. 
uh, for when the ball went into Tommy Walsh. Now, uh, in the commentary, Thomas Niblock said uh, they hoofed the ball in, but they didn't. They, Tommy Walsh had made about four or five runs, and they were determined to make it a crossfield ball and not a straight ball. Uh, t- that's why I was saying to you yesterday, you know, be interested to see what, what Tony thought about that. But uh, we were like giddy kids after it, and then we went, went and met, met the Gooch and a, and a couple of boys, and uh, they, they were totally unfazed by it. We weren't that impressed by it, just thought it was just normal Gary playing. And, and like one of the phrases used was, if, it, look, if the sun was shining, it was 20 plus degrees, uh, there was no wind. If you can't play football that day, you know, if you can't play football like that, that day, you can't play football. And uh, so that sort of took the wind out of our sails a little bit because like we were eulogizing about how, how good they were. But I still think that. Uh, you know the the question marks around where Kerry are at are still there. Were you surprised I mean, that David Clifford played the full match? Yes, very surprised. I thought, to be honest, at half time he might give them himself and Sean O'Shea another five minutes, but he seems very reluctant not to take uh, to take him off. And I, I don't know if that's something that they've discussed themselves or Clifford just wants to play, but. Look, when you're in a form like that, you don't want to come off anyway. So he, he might have been asked, you know, listen, do you need a bit of a break or do you need to come off? And he probably said no chance of enjoying himself too much. Because he was. He was just enjoying himself. That's all he was doing. Um, but just, yeah. just. just Tyrone yeah. were very accommodating though, weren't they? Tyrone were very accommodating to Kerry. But genuinely, Paul, a lot of people think, oh, Tyrone went down there and, and, and didn't bother. But they did. They, like, they were genuinely shocked after like Brian Dewar again met Thomas and he and he says because Thomas always from Derry I'm from Armagh so uh, uh, Brian Dewar said Thomas I suppose you were loving that and uh, and Thomas says no not at all, not at all. <laughs> and and he's, and then Dewar says uh, who's with you and Thomas says McConville he, <laughs> he just went oh no so <laughs> I think that just put the ten hat and things that, that we were there to, to witness it but definitely they were trying. And did you see? Different things. Did you meet Tyrone players afterwards, or did you? Did you? Did you? Were you talking to any from the Tyrone camp yourself? No, no, no. They were all in the bus when we were walking past. Uh, we just waved at them. Yeah, stop to fix your hair in the window. And... No, nobody waved back. But anyhow, look at we, 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 we continue. But look at as I say, they were shell shocked leaving. I know they were staying in Killarney, so maybe they got a bit of that in their system on 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 Saturday night and move on. Tyrone are not that bad, uh, but defensively they were all over the place. Uh, and and Ronan McMe off injured, Derek Cameron off injured, and uh, McShane was kicking around before the game, and he will change things big time uh, for them because they, they that's what they need. I mean, they kicked high ball into Mark Bradley, they kicked high ball into Darren McCurry. In fairness, McCurry won a good bit of it, but uh, there didn't seem to be any real shape or make to 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 what they were doing. I I could sense they were trying something. Uh, I'm just not sure if there's enough work done yet, yeah, but look, they were work in progress. Yeah, are they? Is that is that the issue with them? They're they're a work in progress. They're trying to move from one style of play to another. Is that is that is it as simple as that? Yeah, I think so. Are they uh, just good enough? Uh, the question marks. Like, I don't think they're good enough right at the top, but they could definitely win an Ulster title. I think. You know, they're they're stubborn enough to to. You know to get through this and, and win in us, but they won't, I don't think they're going to challenge the big. I don't think anybody in us is going to challenge the big boys. You know, Kerry, Mayo, uh, Dublin. Keith, which of the Kerry forwards would you like to pick up? <laughs> None of them at the moment. The way they're going. Um, oh, look, I, I don't know. Like even. Oh, if you wanted to have a if you wanted to have a cut at one of those Kerry forwards, who would you like to mark? Oh, you'd have to go with Clifford, so. If you're going to test yourself, you have to go off the top, don't you? Um, How would you play him? How would you play him? What would you look to do? <laughs> like, I, I suppose I would have always kind of played from in front anyways. Um, but then you you see the way he kind of cut back in, I think particularly for the penalty, the first goal chance the last year, that kind of double and cut that they've been doing the last couple of years. So that could be a bit, uh, mightn't be the best move to make. But like I know even the couple of times we would have played them before, he's he's cute for a, for a younger player. He's very cute, like you know, he'll hold out the defender, he'll do it pulling, dragging off the ball, um, to make his run. So, like for a young guy, he is fairly cute like that. But um, yeah, look, you'd, you'd want to test it out against him, but I'm not sure how well it'll go. Like he's a big lad, he's well able to move. But the boys are talking about there, like it's that 
it's that nearly first step, you know, he'll kind of wind up like he's looking about to take a shot. And if there's a bit of a defender near him at all, he's got that kind of long bounce. Um, and he takes a, a very big step and kind of gets that yard. You know, I think a couple of points he got against Dublin the last day um, when he's married to Mickford time as well, similar to that. So, like, I mean, they're all moving fairly well. Like, even you see Moyna and they're like, shit clipping in with a couple of points, getting a few assists. Like, they're all moving very well. So, yeah, you wouldn't single out anyone at the moment. But um, just going back to your question there a few minutes ago on Dublin, like, I mean, they just seem to be kind of doing, as you said, doing what they do all the time. Like, there's no fuss about them. Like, watching the game the last day, they were, like, I thought Tony Gall were doing well for the first kind of 15 minutes or so. Um, and next thing, 10 minutes later, they were five or six points down. So, like, Dublin just go through what they do, like, without any fuss, without any hassle. There's no panic. Um, and as Oshin said there, like, they just play, they stick to their game plan, they know it all off so well at this stage. And, you know, they always just seem to come out the right side of it. Having looked at the weekend's matches, can you see a scenario whereby if Mayo come through Connacht, they play Dublin in the All-Ireland semi-final in the middle of August, can you see a scenario whereby Mayo uh, beat Dublin? You'd like to think so. Um, I suppose, look, we were probably, the, when the championships before the championship started last year as well, we were probably thinking about Dublin, were they as good as they were in previous years? We were questioning them, you know, Mead putting a good performance in the league up in Parnell Park, um, ran them fairly close. You're kind of wondering whether well, Dublin, as good as they were, are they really up for this? And next thing they just come out of the championship and they blew everyone away, like. Um, so we're probably kind of nearly saying the same at the moment, like they're still winning their games without being really, really good. But as Oshin said, you're probably just waiting for them to explode come semi-final stage, which would be worrying from a Mayo point of view if they did. But yeah, look, you have to be positive. I think if Mayo got a bit cuter, maybe, um, maybe get them in a semi-final, you know, it's a cliche, but they might say it's the best time to get them. But, um, do you know, I think for Mayo to, Mayo probably need crowds back of the game, I think. They need that bit of atmosphere to it. They need the crowd get from behind them to kind of drive them on because they kind of play, kind of try to play a high intensity game. And sometimes it's difficult when there's no crowd because there's a challenge match feel. Um, so, yeah, you'd like to think they have a chance to get them a semi-final, but... Um, that's what we've been saying that the last couple of years, and it hasn't worked out. If you were if you were uh, in charge of Mayo, would you want to play the league Division Two final next Sunday against Kildare next Saturday or next Sunday? Probably not. Seeing what happened with the two O'Connors there yesterday, um, you know, with the two boys going off injured in the first half is a big worry. Um, so I think as much and all as you want to be playing games. Uh, I suppose, with all due respect, I suppose Sligo and Leitrim on the side of the draw were on, we should be coming through them anyways. But at the same time, yeah, I think they probably wouldn't mind a week off. Like, I know players want to be playing games and you want to be playing week on week, but sometimes playing four, or five, six, seven weeks in a row is difficult. You know, I think three or four weeks in a row is enough. You need a week's break. So I think they'll be happy enough with that. Yeah, Offaly Derry is going ahead next Saturday in mm. Park Park in the... in. It looks like it'll be the only league final, which I think whoever wins that match must be declared league winners uh, by by any by, by any logic. Um, but I think they're right to play it. I know they're playing loud the following weekend, but I think it's a game in Croke Park. It's a chance to run the panel. It's a, it may there, there's a chance it will be a challenge match anyway. I can see it from an injuries point of view, but an experience to to to, to go up there and play a match in Croke Park, I think, is not one to be spurned. No, I think the, I think it depends on where teams are at. Like, I think from Mayo's point of view, I don't think there's a huge amount to be gained from playing another game. Whereas the likes of maybe off here, Derry, they're going well. A bit of momentum behind them, you know. Another game like that's going to do them no harm if they're kind of trying to build something. So I think it depends on where teams are at. So from their point of view, I can see why they'd want to do it. From a Mayo point of view, I think it's the opposite. Yes, again though. If you look at it, Mayo are not going. To, Mayo are going to play two Division Four teams, yeah, and most mm -hmm. likely play play a Connacht final, and that's well into July before that's played. Right at the end of July, that's a long time without playing a, a really, uh, you know, a, a match against a Division One or Division Two team. Yeah, it is. Um, but I suppose look, they'll be kind of relying on doing what's kind of served them well the last couple of months and in training in-house games whatever it is they're at because you know that's all they can rely on because i just don't think look i could be completely wrong james Horn have a different view on it maybe they would want to play it but i just think um get the week off get a few of the niggles i know there's probably other few niggles in the camp as well get them all cleared up and then 
you know, get through the, the Sligo and Leitrim game and see where you go from there against Galway or Roscommon. But I just think from their point of view, they probably just want to probably look forward to it with a downtime, I'd imagine. I think, that's, oh. uh, I, think I think that Mayo are the one team that wouldn't want that extra game. Yeah. I think, personally, because of the way the thing is set up and the way they're going to uh, try and... They're probably just going to try and take it down again and, and then take it up in stages because uh, of the draw that they have and how later on the season is going to be a lot more important to them. And and from did you see Armagh? Did you watch Armagh's coming? I watched it last night, yeah. What do you think? Um... I I wasn't that happy the day we played Monon and that was the game we won. And I watched the other two games and I seen loads in it that um, I was buoyed by. Uh, I think uh, both Tyrone and Donegal games we had to have a few more fit players on the bench. I think we could have seen those games out. We have a few we had a few boys back yesterday, which obviously in in. Uh, in, in relation to the bench, strengthen the bench up, and uh, we had, we had enough players to come off and finish it off. But I think from after fifteen minutes, I think, and that certainly after the water break, I'm out. Uh, you more or less put the game to bed in the next fifteen minutes. Uh, I thought I I think I'm uh, have been uh, very very impressive um, in regards uh, how much they have uh, tightened up defensively. And also being having taken away that much from uh, from the other end of the field, I think in the middle of the park, I think we we our tendency has always been to to give the opposition the kickouts over the last number of years. I think we looked as if I look as if we can push up now, force them to kick it to the middle, and we seem to be winning a good bit in the middle now as well. So uh, I've always said, you know, from I think for me at up, we're as good as anybody. Um, it's just how we are defensively, and there's a bit more organisation about it. You know, you, you're of, saying our forwards are as good as Kerry and Dublin's forwards. Uh, I think we can compete, uh, Paul, with 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 most of those um, most of those from a forward division. I think um, uh, Grugan's going well. He's probably in as good a form as I've seen him. Uh, Stephen Campbell can be a little bit hit and miss, but he's going well as well. Um, so. Add that to the to the boys who are already that you know. Uh, I was going to say the mainstays, but they're only they're still young lads. But um, and I think as I say, we have uh, two lads. We have Torbett off the bench, whose nickname is Torbo. So I'll tell you, uh, that's not to do with a set with his surname. But uh, Torbett, and we also have Jason Duffy, who um, don't think he come on yesterday, but again, you know, a, a talent. So. Uh, yeah, I think we are a match for anybody up front, but um, there's still question marks about us defensively. But we we seem to have more cover for that than we than we than we had. It's not all, you know. When when Ian Morris talks about Samba football, like am I still getting bodies back in there when we were able to slow the play down in the middle of the park? Like so, um, that's definitely helping things. Um, we've had too many games in the Atlanta grounds, uh, and it's a wee bit tighter than other pitches. Or rather, we had to have. Um, we will rather be seeing a little bit more of the country and uh, and a, a few more pitches, but uh, the league was what it was. And <clears throat> as I say, you know, we Arma have have Antrim, which uh, won't be easy, but I think Arma will win that game. And then whoever wins between probably themselves and Monaghan, then to for an Ulster final. So if you're in an Ulster final, I think that's having stayed in Division One, that'll be serious progress for our market in relation to what we've done over the last three or four years. We have to, if we're going to talk about the Ulster Championship, we have to talk about the Ulster Champions. And Ushin, Cavan are now in Division Four, having been relegated three years on the bounce. The first year they got relegated, they got to an Ulster final. The second year they got relegated to Division Three, they won the Ulster Championship. But it's very difficult to see this now. Very difficult to see them recovering for an Ulster Championship here. They'll, they'll rally. There's no doubt about it. And they'll give, they'll give Tyrone loads of it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's that whole second season type syndrome uh, where, you know, you've been successful and, and, uh, and there's a, all of a sudden there's a dip. But I have to say, this dip has been alarming. Even though it's been a short format league, I mean, they've been poor, they were decent against Derry, I thought, and probably could have won that game. 
Um, but they were, they've been sh they were shocking at the weekend again. I mean, the amount of chances they missed. Um, and, like, I think there was a certain amount of arrogance about, you know, playing Wicklow. I, thought, I think they thought, you know, whatever happens, we'll still win this game. And uh, and they found themselves in a in a position that uh, they could have got themselves in the game had to kick the ball over the bar in the last uh, ten minutes, but um, it hasn't been good enough for for Calvin. But think about Calvin in Division Four. Like that's it's similar to it's similar to the to the fall that Derry took, you know, uh, Division One final uh, against the Dubs right down into Division Four, and obviously they're claiming again, but. Uh, for Calvin, look, I, I, there's, there's absolutely no doubt about it. They'll, they'll, they'll circle the wagons, and as I say, they'll give throwing all they want in the in the Ulster Championship. But uh, it's a bad, it's a massive body blow if you're looking to attract players, young players next year, and a few players who maybe have left the scene to come back. I don't know if they'll see it as as in Tyson come back in to play Division Four football. You know, it's really interesting, actually. Derry, Leash, Westmead, they're all teams who have gone from Division 1 to Division 4, complete cascade. Loud went from 2 to 4 as well. If you start falling, it can be very hard to, 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 to stop it sometimes. And Paddy was really struck by this questioning of Cavan's hunger from Wicklow after the game. After you won your first Munster Championship, and then after you won in All-Ireland, did you find that following league campaign difficult? Yeah, look, naturally it's difficult enough to, to come back after success, but I suppose it depends on the group. Um, we were fortunate enough to have a kind of a fairly mature and level group that Grandy went and celebrated. Again, I'm not sure with the, the COVID restrictions how much Tip and Cavan could do over, over Christmas period and stuff. But like when you were operating at the level of Division, Division One and you know you're used to competing with the best teams anyway, you know, that success, while it was great and all, you know, it was still your 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 standard, your normal standard was pretty high anyway. So maybe for Kevin and Tipperary, it's just been difficult to get back to, to basics. Um, you know, it's very hard for Tip down to be down Division 4. Um, I know, like, last last year or two, they've, some of their lads have been talking about going travelling and they've held back. Um, you know, being in a dual county where hurling is prom prominent, it's it's those things are very, very difficult. You know, young players coming through now, will I, will I go to football for a few years um, or not? And you're looking at them in Division 4. You know, that might have a big, big impact on, on some young players coming through. So, like, probably I'd be very concerned about Munster having, you know, uh, Tipperary dropping down there because they're better than that. Again, though, they you know, the championship, they're facing the winners of carrying players, so, you know, carrier waiting for them, possibly, uh, and that's the season over. So they have a long, long uh, summer and winter to, to mull over facing Division 4. Um, but, yeah, look, uh, for me, it was always just about resetting and, and resetting your goals and, and, and you know, everyone's starting on a level playing field. But again, that comes from the group and the maturity of the group. And that's the, the beauty of maybe of Dublin is that group, no matter how much they win, they seem to come back again. It's so, so level-headed, so mature. And um, that's what sets them apart. But Tipperary and Cavan, it must be desperate because, you know, you start losing games and you're, you're chopping changing everything and just you've no consistency. Um, and Division 4, I presume we'll be back to seven games next year. So I would imagine Tip and Cavan, We'll, we'll start to the favourites, get all that and, and try to build a bit of momentum for next year's championship. What, what do you think of the league structure, the divisions one and one, one to four set up? Yeah, like, I, I suppose I loved it as a player when you're operating division one, you're, you're playing the best teams the whole time and, you know, there's just high profile games and, and whatnot. But like when you look at it overall, I know going back, I'm not sure how, when it changed from 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B, but like if you're looking at the likes of, of Westmead or Clare um, in Division 2 and they want to progress you know they'd love to be operating playing the odd game against the top teams so split the groups there I think would be would be very beneficial um, you know the likes of Dublin and Kerry and Mayo these teams I know Mayo dropped down now but like they're, they're just getting so competitive with each other the standards are being raised the whole time they're learning so much from playing against the, the better teams and if you had I know now you might say if Westmead went up against Kerry or, or Leash up against Dublin the league or whatever they might face face a desperate hammering but I think if you had an, an A team league like that where it was mixed between you know the old the current division one and division two, I think you'd see teams like Kerry or Dublin using those those games against the let's say so called weaker counties as kind of chances to run the panel a bit and, and the games would still be competitive and, and the stronger teams would still be getting the benefit of, of using the squad pairs, whereas you'd have the maybe two or three very high profile games in each of those divisions. Um, I just think a bit like uh, you know, they talk about the, the soccer, the Super League there, 
the, the elite just keep on raising standards while the rest fall a bit behind. I think we could do with a bit more exposure for the, the smaller counties the, um, against the bigger counties, not just in, you know, you might point to Clare and Tipperary don't get to play Kerry, but that's a once-off game, that's a knockout game, they're done. Um, I think I think we'd all benefit a bit more from, from uh, you know, a b- bigger variety of games because, to me, it just feels like there's a monopoly now in the top teams. You could probably see the same four or five teams staying in Division 1 for the last best part of a decade, uh, I'd be big time in favour of, of changing up a bit and going back to the old style for a couple of years anyway. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think it's an article of faith within the GA at the moment that the four divisions work, and I think the I think all the facts show that the opposite is the case. I think it, there has to be a serious questioning of the structures. More than one-fifth of counties have never played in divisions one or two. So if you have a structure that's like working like that, it's very difficult to see. You can see how it suits the top counties, and it's great when your team when your team wins and i say it look at from an awfully point of view awfully since the league change happened in 2007 awfully have played in division three and division four they have gone from being contenders for leinster championship and previously a division one team i got stuck down there not to get out of it and i think like it seemed to me that every every sunday during the 2000s from 2010 to 2019 we see awfully seem to be playing longford on an endless reel of matches it was longford westmead and niche and it was terrible for those teams and longford in fairness usually usually won but it was it was you got stuck on a treadmill and you get used to the same thing and then when the championships changed so it's the same games again and you get a separation that is enormous between both teams and if you're a cavern footballer and you're a tipperary footballer Realistically, if your ambition is to play Division One footballer football, you're looking at a four or five year plan from where you are now to have any hope of getting back up, and that that's a long time to expect someone to commit to playing to playing in these things. Whereas if it's a one A and one, so you have a two tier division with sixteens and split two, Yoshi, you look like you disagree. Uh, well, I just think I actually I actually like the way it works, and I think if you're in Division Four, you're in Division Four for a reason, and I think. It does um, sometimes put the focus on like a four or five year plan, um, you know, a four or five year cycle, as you put it. Uh, what's wrong with that? There's no quick fix to you know getting from Division Four to Division One. And sometimes we think, well, I know what we'll do. We we'll take in a high profile manager and we we'll give him X, Y, and Z, and we hope that that will take us back to Division One. And you know, it it often. What will happen in Calvin, guarantee you, over the next uh, number of months is there'll be a look at all of the structures uh, within Calvin football and uh, it'll be addressed. That's what has happened in Lowe's, okay? So, okay, so Lowe's have taken in a high-profile manager, but in the in the background, what Lowe's have done is they have ripped it up and started again as far as uh, uh, progression for players, uh, a player pathway, all of those sort of things. Uh, the coaching systems, all that, and and I think that's a long term a good thing for for Louth because as I say, there's no quick fixes for them, and I think more more counties that you know drop down, and uh, and look at that and think you know we have to do ser- something seriously about this in order to progress again. So uh, that's about the Division Four thing. Um, as far as the leagues themselves go, I think. I agree with you in that this year it looks a bit skewed, but I think if we have championship with backdoor system, no super eights, and we have our league system, I think that's as good as what we can hope for because ideally in the ideal world we would not have provincial championships. Provincial championships make absolutely no sense anymore, no sense whatsoever. But will they be got rid of? No. So we're going to have to think about walking. Uh, with that and I think the best way to do that is through uh, the backdoor system and also maybe add in uh, you know the the, the dreaded uh, B challenger in that you know if you're in Division 3 or Division 4 you still have something to play for after your initial backdoor game not after not after you're put out of the championship but in, so I, I agree with I, I, I agree with the idea of of a, having a long, longer term plan. And I really admire what loud football are doing, really admire it. But why not make it easier for them? Why not help them along the way by constructing a system whereby it's achievable goal for them now to get and play top teams within a couple, within a year. So they come up and they're into division three next year. That's not fit to play top teams. 
So the, top, so how do you help them play the top teams? How do you help a team develop if they don't get exposure to it? If well, if, they, well they're going to get exposure to us. They're going to get exposure uh, loud and awfully play. I mean, like we were, we've already discussed this. That that's a game that either team can realistically win. That's going to give them exposure to playing against probably a Division Two team, uh, maybe a team on, on the way to Division One next. Uh, if there's a backdoor system, that's going to give them exposure to playing somebody else around the country, uh, possibly from again from from a higher division. But now that this is to play against a Division One team, that's not going to work. And uh, it's the same with Wicklow, Wicklow coming, you know, in Division Three, and it's the same with the Waterfords and all of those and all of those teams. So, uh, as I say, there's no quick fix. The league works. The league does work. I think, in my humble opinion, the league walks. I mean, it, we are a bit skewed because of the fact that we were thinking about the league. We're just after having, and it wasn't wasn't acceptable for anybody. Wouldn't be accept, shouldn't be acceptable for anybody. But that's the way it was in the circumstances we were in. But like you know, next year I think if we set back, we have a full list of fixtures. We're properly organised and we're ready to go. And we do the uh, championships, and we do the backdoor system, and we do also do a big championship. I think that's as good as the lower tier teams can sort of ask for at this stage, personally speaking. Yeah, I think, Paul, on that, I think, as Oshin said, like the provincials is just so restrictive, the provincial structure. Like having that in the middle of the summer or between the league and championship just, just negates every possible development you can do because. Um, like if we could have the provincials just sh sh uh, shifted to the start of the season, you know, March, April, and have them as the, you know, they're not the McGrath Cup or the McKenna Cup or whatever, but that they're the starting point and there's a bit of silverware there. They're completely separate, just your local rivalry for, for a month, five, six weeks, whatever it is. Um, it can be played in knockout or group stages, whatever way you want to do it. And then like if you could have a system where the, the, there could be some exposure for the, the lower teams, you know, Division 4, Division 3, that there's some bit of a mixture, even if you had two from every division in a group together. And then from there, obviously, there'd be a lot of mismatches, but again, use that as a development thing for the bigger teams. And then from there, then, you know, C teams into into uh, an A and a B championship. At least then every year, you're getting your, your local rivalry games in, in your provincial, you're getting a mixture and exposure in the, in the league. And then you're, you're, you're seeding teams and sprint teams and saying, right, this is the serious stuff. You know, you're at your level now and, and off with you for the summer. Um, that's where I'd love to go. But again, if we didn't do it during a lockdown and pandemic, I don't want to be able to do it. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, I think the league has ended up as a farce. And I say this as someone from a county who has benefited from it. But I think I think the, the idea of a structured competition which doesn't finish is is a remarkable thing to, to set up, number one. Number two, I also think it was desperately unfair on those teams who had to travel to play what we are told is the most important game promotion relegation and defining game for so many seasons to set up a structure whereby teams had to travel it was wrong that Galway had to travel to Monaghan it was wrong also by the way that Fermanagh had to travel to Tullamore and play nothing to do with COVID it's an unfair thing for for a key game like that to be decided in in a in a particular way Keith can I just ask you actually the Connacht Championship how much did you look forward to the Connacht Championship every year Oh yeah, huge amount. Like I mean, regardless, I suppose of how things were going in the league. Like come the championship, you know, you were always looking to be playing um, a goal or a Roscommon, who'd be one of your biggest or two of your biggest rivals. Like so, it was it was always a huge thing. Like I, I get the point that the championship probably isn't fit for purpose at the moment, or um, there are probably better structures that could be out there, but. Um, you know, you still, I still think the provincials, they do mean a lot to players. Like I said, when you're playing your biggest rivals, they are important. So, um, you know, you did look forward to it, but yeah, like, I just don't know what the, the best structure to have in place is. I think if you put the provincials as nearly like your pre-season competitions, I think it takes a lot of the value out of them as well. Um, so can you factor them into a championship and, and still get a good structure? I don't know, but like as Oshin said there, like it's they're not going to get rid of them anytime soon. Um it's hard to see it happening, but um yeah, to answer your question, you always look forward to them. Paul, you Paul, you probably know a little bit more about the workings of, of Co Park maybe than the rest of us, but if if um if the, if the, we got rid of the provincial championships, uh how do we recompense the um the provincial the provincial councils? Um, because that's essentially what it's about. It's a, it's, a, it's a money thing. And I'm just wondering, 
like can we can we gauge you know percentage wise of gates and just put all the money in the pool and chop it up at the end is that is that something that, that could possibly do is that the solution to this if somebody brings that forward I think power matters. I think power matters. Office holders matter. The organization of the provincial structure developed from the second year in the GEA. The first, this is one of the was, was forgotten things. The very first year of the All-Ireland Championship was an open draw. Anybody could play in it. And it was in the second year that they went to provincial structures. And over the years, these provincial structures accumulated their own power. And the story of every sporting organization is the story of administrators who are in a particular situation in power and are low to give up that power because it's not just out of ego but because of the structures that have built up around them and if you take away that structure of something you you have to find a way to give something back as well as moving 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 to a new dispensation and it doesn't seem to me that the will is there and i think paddy's point is a brilliant one if we weren't prepared to do this during a pandemic to have a different cut to have an open draw championship as a once off then it's very difficult to see how how that's going to how that's going to change in church and it was really interesting on on Saturday evening I was in Tullamore to to watch Offaly um for Manna and well I would like to say to to the to the Offaly players who played that day they've suffered a lot of pain over the years and there are some brilliant footballers in Offaly and for them to get out of division 3 despite all the question marks and all the criticism in the past it was a huge achievement by, by Offaly footballers and they are well fit. The Offaly have some brilliant footballers and particularly brilliant forwards and they are well fit to thrive in Division 2 when 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 they go up there. But on on Saturday evening in Tournament, Larry McCarty, president of the GA, was there. He was there with Pat Tehan, a leading light within the GA as well and they were walking around the pitch. Now, Larry McCarty comes from a different type of GAA administrative background than the people who've previously been in the job. Most of his career has been in New York GAA. He is perfectly placed between his experience of the GAA and between his background in sports business administration and his knowledge of the wide sporting scene to do something radical here, to do something in a way, and he should take this on. He should take it on in a way that isn't just a lipstick on a pig B championship being set up where we get another dump in the corner of, of teams that kind of let's get them out of the way quickly, let's get them out of sight, but to come up with something imaginative. And it is not enough as well just to be imaginative about structures. There also has to be investment in coaching, long-term commitment to all of these things rather than just looking for uh, a structural fix. Because I don't know how many counties after these matches can genuinely see themselves being competitive in a provincial championship in the way that's coming in the coming weeks. I don't see, if you are, if you were in the Leinster championship, I think if you're Kildare, you've, you can see a future here. But and if you're Mead even, Mead won't be too far away. But beyond that, where are you going? Who do you, play, who do you end up playing against? And for, for these counties, how do Sligo prepare to play Mayo? Like how, have you talked to John McEntee about this, Oshin? Yeah, it was Tony. It was over them. <laughs> oh, Tony, yeah, sorry. <laughs> this, uh, you've been waiting that's for this one again. Worth, that's, that's worth its weight in gold. Uh, <laughs> there you go. I'm so happy with that. You left, but, you uh, left John off. You you picked that team between our man and Tyrone. John McEntee is your best friend, isn't he? Or one of your best friends. <laughs> you picked the combined team between our man and Tyrone for the best team. You left him off. Is, is that right? Yeah, that's a completely different podcast and we're not talking about that. So, um, <laughs> my, mo my mother still fell out me over. Uh, so, I... And you picked yourself. <laughs> oh, Paul, Paul. Paul, I think that was, I had, to, I had that was part of the contract. <laughs> I had to pick myself. Um, but anyhow, I've been talking to Tony McIntyre. I haven't been talking to him since the, um, since the loud game and I suppose they, that's when they will be very disappointed and again look if league was everything to, to Sligo this year just to try and get out of that division you know and the fact that they haven't managed to do that um, you know is disappointing and, and look at it's a it's an uphill task I mean first of all you know to play in that Shield game you know even the fact even the fact that they've named it the Shield game even if they just had said listen lads there's another game you know, but the fact that it was a shield game, uh, you know, wouldn't whet the appetite, I'm sure, for too many players. How do you sell a division four shield match to any player? Like how do you how do you manage that? 
Well, when you're as direct, and, and Keith will tell you, when you're as direct and honest as Tony, he wouldn't even try because he, he'd know that, that people were, were... But he would see it as another game, another opportunity to uh, try things out, for, obviously, for uh, for, Mayo, for the Mayo game. But look at, you know, Sligo operating in Division 4 and Mayo are Division 1 team and, and, and always will be. Um it's 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 an onerous task, it really is. It's a it's a horrible situation to be in. But look, it's, it's Tony's only been there a couple of months. You know, he's played in a in a disjointed league, and I'm pretty sure that um, Sligo will be a different proposition if he sticks around for next year. You know, and and but if if Sligo play in Division Four in the league next year, Carlo and Leitrim, not too bad. Seven eight team division, Carlo and Leitrim, not too bad. Tip and Cavan back down there. That's a fair. That's a fair challenge to come out of uh, come come out, come out of that division. But in the short term, coming to see them against Mayo, it must be quite quite a challenge to prepare for Mayo. Can you keep? Can you see a scenario whereby Sligo will beat Mayo in the championship? No, to be as brutally honest as you can, um, you know I think you just have to look at the results in the league, and obviously you haven't seen any of the games, but you're looking at the score lines and the type of performances they seem to be putting in like and you just don't know where where a good performance is going to come out of like but i think the hardest part for for tony and the sligo guys is you know they lose to mayo in two weeks time they mightn't see each other again for the next four months five months until the end of the year and they start preparing for next year you know so that's the hardest thing and um that's the biggest obstacle for teams who are trying to develop and trying to put a plan in place that you know if you're out of the championship early you might see each other for a few months whereas the teams that are getting to the back end of the championship and the successful teams they're with each other for nine months of the year um so look yeah, to back your point can you see them give it a beat mayo no can you see them putting up them for half an hour 40 minutes you'd hope so just to make it competitive but apart from that you can't really see anything else happen and similarly then leitrim in a semi-final so mayo could could arrive in to play roscommon or galway having played two division four teams essentially and Roscommon, I don't know if you saw much of Galway at the weekend or if you saw Roscommon, but h- how would you how would you appraise the situation of both of those teams? Yeah, I would have seen a bit of... Well, I didn't really see much of the Galway Monaghan game um, coming back from Ennis yesterday, but like from seeing Galway in the league, obviously the first day out was a bit of a farce, really, but they seemed to go a bit more defensive than after that. Um, they seemed to get a decent enough structure there, so Galway were OK. Um, like when you have a couple of the forwards that they have that always cause bother um, and they always will kind of cause a bit of trouble to Mayo. Ross Common then is hurting a lot to make them like in the league. They just never looked like they were causing any team any trouble. Do you know, it's it's funny. You look at them and they're just happy to play kind of a slow tempo game. There's no pace to it. They don't look like they're trying to get the ball in quickly to like the Cox and Mert and these boys who can actually score inside, you know, because they're they're good footballers. So, um it's hard to know where Roscommon are at, but look, if it came down to it, it was a kind of final again with Mayo or playing either Goa or Roscommon, it's not going to be a huge amount in it. I mean, we saw last year with Goa, like it was, obviously it was at the end of the year and it was soft pitch and it was badly up on Salt Hill and it kind of turned into a very 50-50 game, but like there's never much in it for those guys. And like the last couple of times Roscommon have been relegated, I think they've gone on to win kind of titles. So they're the type of team who can rally, I think, Oh, she made a point there about Cavan. There will be a bounce off them for the championship. Like, you know, they seem to be a team, you know, not that they don't take the league seriously, but they just never seem to hit the heights that they, they want to or that they need to. And then they can just kind of come championship, they can put in a couple of big performances. So, um, yeah, you'd be kind of more fearful of Galway, I suppose, than Ross Common going on the last couple of weeks' performances. Sunday, the 4th of July, uh, quarter past one in the Hyde, Oshin, Ross Common against Galway. Who'll win that? From the evidence of what I've seen, Roscommon are going to be very, very difficult to beat. Uh, the performance, I'll go with the performance against Kerry because I actually watched that whole game. The performance against Kerry wasn't wasn't actually that bad. Um, I just think they couldn't afford to have injuries. Picked up a couple of injuries yesterday and I think Gull will be smart in a massive way um, after what happened yesterday and they'll feel injustice and feel all those things and when you have those things in the change room uh, if you can use them in the right way they are uh, they are um, they are a massive help so I personally speaking on what on the evidence of what I've seen and just that extra little bit of spark that 
that goal we have and the players that can, that can change a game and turn it on its head, uh, I'll go with Gola. Paddy, when you, when you were playing, did you ever use a sense of injustice or did Cork use a sense of injustice to drive you along? Sense of grievance? Um, I suppose there was times maybe there was the odd sending off or something or somebody got, uh, you know, was Judge Harsh or, or something like that. Maybe the, the team Did Frank have... not get you sorted out anytime you had a fella sent off? Did you not? Um, I'm not. I can't. I don't want to call it Ian's. So no. <laughs> um, he may have. Um, no, I suppose, look, everyone gets motivation from different places. Um, you know, if you look at, let's say, even Munster this year, what's the motivation for the teams? Cork, obviously, um, looking to back up last year's victory over Kerry and prove they're, they're at that level. For Kerry, it's it's the opposite. It's to, it's to right the wrongs they feel from last year. Um, look, motivation is a huge factor for every team. Like, that's that's why I, I saw an article this morning, when you're looking at Leash and Mead, let's say, in Leinster, and what's their... You know, what's their enthusiasm for the summer ahead? Like, you know, with, with Dublin there, at least in, in Connacht and in Ulster, there's probably three teams who you'd say at least in each uh, province who could, um, who could you could see winning the provincial title in in Leinster. Obviously, it's, it's a, a done deal. Um, in Munster, you know, it's, it's hard to say it's a done deal after last year, seeing, seeing Cork be carrying and Tip beating Cork, but, um, you know, you'd expect Kerry to be, to be a couple of levels above everyone, but, um, you know, the, the, the knockout this year is just a killer. It's a straight knockout with no, no back door is a killer for teams because, um, you know, you have to, you get the unfortunate Claire, you're, you're lumped up against Kerry and, and, you know, you could be done in two weeks after having a very decent uh, league. So, um, no, going back, I don't I don't recall any massive grievances in our part. Um, I suppose the, the maybe the, the dislike towards your neighbours over the border might be the, the, the fueling factor there. Now, like, after the league was always a long enough period, we'd go back to our clubs for a game or two in hurling and football, um, so we've been disjointed for a few weeks. Whereas now, I think you've uh, like Cork aren't playing Limerick or Waterford hit for four weeks, so they have a four week block of, of solid training where they can really ramp up the intensity and the fitness. I'm oh, sorry, there is a, a senior A final, Aero or Mallow, playing next Saturday, so that that's one small thing. But um, this block of, of three four weeks training is going to be savage, intense for for teams because you're not worried about holding lads back for league games the weekend. It's going to be it's going to be flat out. So. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how much they develop because Cork, you know, I always feel as a Cork man, we're restricted by the amount we play our clubs. Generally, we'd have always played in April or May, we'd have used our clubs uh, a lot, a lot more than other teams, certainly, a lot of other counties. This year it's different, so they'll have a full panel to pick them for, for three, four weeks, so they should make massive gains tactically and, and physically in the next three, four weeks. So, Paddy, you're calling Kerry and Dublin as provincial champions. Who are you saying in Connacht? I'd be hard to pass Mayo, but as, as Keith said, they're, they're not that far ahead of, of the rest. You know, you, you would see Ross Common and Galway catch them. You know, that's that's well within the, the bounds of possibility. Um, you'd still fancy Mayo to come out and then up north. Uh, like Armad, who have a nice side of the draw, you know, if they, it's got over Antrim and, and you think it could take them on in too. Um, like, obviously, I, I feel Danny Gallagher are one of the top two, but just the way that the draw falls, maybe Armad could sneak it. But... Uh, yeah, it's again going back to the provincial thing. It's a shame that there's there's Leinster is is sewn up and, and Munster is probably uh, out of the reach of, of most. That would leave your All Ireland final semi finals as Dublin v Mayo v and Kerry v Armagh. So who's going to play? Uh, I'm, I'm being generous there, giving that to Armagh. No, if if I was to, to it's, I, I still fancy Donegal. In, okay, we we'll say oh. Kerry Donegal then. We'll say Kerry Donegal and Dublin Mayo. So who's in the final? Uh, Kerry Dublin. Um, and who wins the final? Dublin, hopefully. Keith, Keith. Oh, yeah. Look, as they said there, you got to go carry Dublin. Anyways, um, I'm going to go with Mayo and Connacht. I think just from what we've seen the last few weeks, if they can keep them performance going, although obviously they have a few weeks now where they're probably. Not playing any of the, the tougher teams, the higher teams, but um, up in Ulster, then I just I can't call Ulster. I mean, I think we said on this podcast a few weeks ago, it's probably between maybe Donegal and Tyrone. Um, they're still there, thereabouts. Armagh definitely come into the reckoning a bit. Um, they've been very impressive, I think, the last few weeks. Probably unlucky not to win a couple of more games. I mean, the Donegal one, they should have won it. Um, yeah, I don't know about Ulster, I can't call it. I'm going to go with Donegal just on the fact that. 
they've shown glimpses. Obviously, they've been poor at the start of some games, but they've come back into them fairly well. So I'm going to go with Donegal just because I'm not completely convinced that Tyrone's changed style and everything just yet. Uh, so Dublin Mayo, Kerry Donegal, who's in the final? Um, Head would probably say Kerry Dublin, Hart will say Kerry Mayo. So who's and winning? You know, you can ask who's the other questions, well, yeah. <laughs> um, so who's winning the final? At the moment, I think just because they really have a chance of toppling Dublin, I'm going to go with Kerry. As much as Paul doesn't want to see it, and I probably wouldn't want to see it either. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I just think he said if the fall was bit of an age be, between Kerry and Mayo, is there? There is, yeah. I don't really know where it came from, to be quite honest. But um, there's always been an age we played them. Maybe 2014 didn't help um, down in Limerick. But uh, yeah, there was always a bit of niggle when we meet them. In fairness, uh, even when we played them in Clarny there two years ago in the Super Race, there was a bit of niggle. You know, they kind of gave us a good hide in that day. But yeah, I just think, like I said before, I think if Kerry forwards can click, like we should, even against Dublin there two weeks ago in the league, like I mean, they hit 118 against Dublin, which you know rarely happens. They only conceded nine points. Um, so I think if they can get that balance right when they're playing the likes of the Dubs, there's Paul said they're different, or Paddy said they're, they're the different type of team who can, can stop them. Oshin, the prediction uh, master, go on. Uh, Dublin, Kerry, Mayo, and I'm going to raise everything I've seen at the weekend. I'm going to say Tyrone. Okay. And uh, who's in the All Ireland final? Uh, Dublin, Kerry. Um, and who's going to win the final, Oshin? Dublin. Okay. Well, I know. Despite, put me, put me, put me, put me neck in the line. Despite there, what you saw the weekend, you're saying, uh, you're, you're, you're still say. No, no, no. I, I, like again, the, the weekend, like it's it's self-explanatory. The the, the the carry is awesome going forward. They really are, but they weren't tested at, at the back. I didn't think of the weekend, and Dublin do that, and I don't know. Just get, I always get the impression Dublin's going to outmuscle them, you know, and I'm uh, just going to they just find a way. So yeah, uh, as, mu as much as I am impressed with Kerry and how good they are and how attractive they are going forward, still Dublin. So I, I, I was just thinking about this the other day, and just in light of what Paddy said about his probably no great desire to see Kerry win, uh, Kerry win anything. This idea of local rivalries, and I have to be fair to you. I have to be fair to you about that Tyrone Armagh podcast. You were instructed that you had to pick yourself. I totally, I totally get that. But I was thinking. I was instructed that, by myself. That yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You didn't take much instruction on no, it. No, yeah. it but I was listening to that podcast and it was just a question that kept coming into my head. When Armagh were playing in the All Ireland finals, or Armagh were playing whoever they were playing from, from Leinster, Munster, or, or, or Connacht, did you want them to win? Or sorry, when Tyrone were? Did you want Tyrone to win? Oh, around that time, like oh, three, yeah. oh sorry, oh five, oh eight. Yeah. No chance. No so you were shouting for Kerry against Tyrone. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No question. Oh, but no I thought it was this whole. Well, we all were. I thought it was this kind of Ulster yeah. rally behind the team. Yeah, Tyrone sort of put an end to that. Like. <laughs> so it's their fault oh, as well. I was, I was there. I was there in ninety five. Yeah, and I was that naive that I was cheering for Tyrone in the canal from the canal end, um, because is it true uh, you had a Tyrone hat on? Is that correct? Definitely not true, <laughs> unless it was Cork Miners were playing. It was it looked uh, <laughs> red and white or something. But um, our traditional rivals in this area are down. Okay, so I went to school in Newry, County Down, uh, in uh, <clears throat> yeah a while ago. 80s, 90s, right? And uh, DJ Kane taught in that school, and we were tortured by down people about. Well, first of all, we were tortured about the 60s, like as if we cared as kids about the 60s. Um, but then they won in '81, and that was the toughest year of my school and life. Uh, and so Tyrone were never our traditional rivals, and uh, and all of a sudden, then you know, you talk to people from the other end of the county whenever you join the county join the county set up and you realize like that there's a real hatred there and and that's what it was for for many a year but when 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 Tyrone were playing in them 2000 game the 05 away absolutely not no chance it's, it's funny, funny. Paul, sorry yeah. Paul 
when I was having a chat with a fellow recently and we were talking about, you know, how many all Irelands in a row must Dublin win before you consider Kerry winning it instead is a better option. <laughs> Um, I don't think that number exists, but uh, <laughs> uh, there's a math theorem maybe can be devised to yeah, yeah, yeah. work out. <laughs> and we're not there yet, anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Keith, we had um, we had Kevin Walsh on the on the podcast last week, and he was very diplomatic when I was asked him how how he felt about Mayo not winning All Ireland, or or you know, did he? Would he have shouted for Mayo? Would you? How would you feel about Galway or Roscommon being relegated? Or, you know, what, what would that would that cross your yeah. mind? Yeah, I suppose it would have been a little smile on the side of your face when you seen the results. All right, um, maybe a little shout for Jack McCarran when he got that point yesterday as well. But um, yeah, like as you know, as Oshin said there, like I mean, when your biggest rivals are playing, or you know, you don't want to be seeing them winning anything or. As long as they're going the, the wrong direction of the league, you're happy. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, you're not going to have too much love for them. It's as simple as that. There's no other way of putting it, really, is there? <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, I'd, say, I'm, I'd, say, I'd say in the last couple of minutes, we've really gone up in the estimation. Of, 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 I know, right? <laughs> just, <like it. laughs> just can be edited, can it? <laughs> well, yeah. well, I know I know that there's general, across around the Midlands, there's general love and respect for Offaly and, and the success that both the hurlers and footballers have gone through the league campaign undefeated, that the sleeping giant has stirred. Here we come. Um, thank you to Larry for running this podcast, to Tony Dean, uh, to Allianz, and to everyone at Examiner Sport for making it happen. A huge thanks to, to Oshin and especially to Keith and Paddy. We'll be back soon. Allianz. Supporting all 32 counties through the Allianz Leagues. Remember that, that's a small bit of a needle there. Come on, Mayo, you've got to get Andy Moran into the game. Listen,